I'm on the mighty Indus River, which gave its name to the whole Indian subcontinent. And I'm beginning a journey deep into ancient India. A journey that will take me back 5,000 years into the past to discover some of its most hidden treasures. I'll be traveling back in time to the ancient civilization that first grew up on the shores of the Indus. I'll be revealing the lost Buddhist culture of northern Pakistan and luxuriating in the extraordinary architectural flowering of the Mughal Empire and the exuberant temples of South India, all of which produce some phenomenal artworks. As an art historian and museum curator, I've looked after these treasures for most of my life. In this series, I want to explore their stories and the people who created them. I'm beginning my journey in Lahore, home to over five million people and the vibrant, beating heart of modern Pakistan. Today we think of Pakistan as an Islamic country, and indeed it was religion that was the cause of its violent severance from Greater India in 1947. What was India's loss was the birth of a new nation, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. But what I want to explore is this country's very rich, more complex and diverse past, which is often forgotten. A time when women were celebrated, the Buddha was worshipped, and the Mughal Empire recreated paradise on earth. So to do that, I need to go to the remains of a city that makes the hall look as if it was built just yesterday. A site that's not just one of the most ancient in Pakistan, but in the whole world. Well, there's always a great sense of adventure to arrive at a station in the subcontinent early in the morning with coolies carrying people's luggage, people have got places to go, just like I have. Pakistan was born less than 70 years ago, a much younger country than India. So it's perhaps ironic that it was the birthplace of a far older civilization. I spent years at the British Museum looking after treasures from the Indian subcontinent. But I've never made this particular journey before. It will take me to the cradle of ancient India. got off the train at Harappa. We're almost 200 kilometers outside Lahore at this tiny station. I seem to be the only person here. But it was here about 100 years ago that under the British, railway workers were uh, creating a passageway to dig this railway, to create this railway, and stumbled upon what appeared to be a very ancient mound of terracotta bricks. How convenient, the workers must have thought and just use the bricks to help make the railway embankment. But when archaeologists were eventually called in, they made one of the great discoveries of the 20th century. What they found defied belief. In this quiet and neglected corner of Pakistan, an enormous city stretching for miles began to emerge from beneath the dusty plains. It's thought the city of Harappa was large enough to house up to 80,000 people. The city was at the height of its success in 2200 BC. It's not until the late 19th century, over 4,000 years later, that European cities reached anything like this scale and order. Even more extraordinary than its size was the realization of quite how old it was. 
When the archaeologist John Marshall came here in 1921, he was the first person who fully appreciated the significance and the actual antiquity of what this site potentially had to offer. So I brought with me a copy of the Illustrated London News from 1924, which was actually when Marshall announced to the world, effectively, what he had discovered and the significance of it. And it begins. Not often has it been given to archaeologists, as it was given to Schliemann at Tyrene's or Mycenae, or to Stein in the deserts of Turkestan, to light upon the remains of a long-forgotten civilization. It looks, however, at this moment as if we were on the threshold of such a discovery in the plains of the Indus. Marshall was trying to rewrite the story of ancient India with one that began here in the subcontinent, not one that had somehow been imported from Europe or the Middle East, as previous archaeologists had imagined. A history that was India's own, a new beginning, if you like, for India's ancient past. The thing that strikes me immediately walking through these ruins is how clearly this was laid out on a grid pattern like a modern city. These people really understood their right angles. But what is extraordinary is what isn't here. For a civilization on this scale, contemporary with the pyramids, is there isn't any grand monument to a single ruler. There isn't any celebration of military might or a ruling theocracy. This was clearly, in a contemporary sense, a much more egalitarian society. And this is not the only city built by what came to be called the Indus Valley Civilization, after the mighty river that threaded them together. Many others were later found, built to a similar template. And yet more remained to be excavated, still buried under mounds in the desert. This was an empire, albeit one without any rulers, and it's an empire that is still giving up its secrets. Gosh, so this was only excavated five yeah. or six days before. Yeah. Still fresh with the mud. Yeah. You can see the accentuation of the breasts, the navel, the wide hips. Um, this is a civilization, like many ancient cultures, that celebrated fertility for very obvious reasons. And these figures appear all over the Indus Valley. These were people who liked their bling. And some of the jewellery found here reveals the use of sophisticated manufacturing techniques. So this delicate bead uh, made of carnelian was considered a highly precious stone um, and were traded really far and wide. What's really remarkable about them is the technology they had using diamonds to drill these very uniform holes through. So they would then string them together and produce these elaborate necklaces for elite citizens to wear. Unlike Pakistan today, this seems to have been a culture that valued, even worshipped, powerful women. And nowhere can this be seen better than in one tiny figure, a priceless treasure from the era, known as the dancing girl, with the stance of an impudent teenager. She has all the poise of Degas' little dancer, and some have described her as the Mona Lisa of ancient Indian art. Now, the original is priceless, and she sits here behind bulletproof glass, which um, even being a museum curator on this occasion, I'm not able to access. So I have here a replica in my hand. And so close up, you can see what's really interesting about her is her stance. For a, a young woman at this very early date, she stands incredibly confidently with her hand on her hip, her head held high, decorated with bangles. There's a confidence and poise about her, which is really surprising to some of our more traditional conceptions and notions of women in South Asia. The dancing girl is unusual and almost unique. At Harappa, what has been found far more commonly are these mysterious seals carved in reverse, 
presumably so they could act as a stamp, leaving a clear image in wax, perhaps to seal a transaction. One of the most amazing features of these tiny seals that were found at Harappa was that nearly 50% of them represented the unicorn, which is a mythological animal that we usually associate with medieval Europe, but actually it first originated here and clearly had great spiritual significance for these people because it appears over and over again but then completely disappeared from this region and traveled through Mesopotamia into ancient Greece and into the legends of Europe that we've all grown up with. This is the first time I've ever held a seal of, from the Indus Valley civilization of this scale. Um, and holding it at this range, you can really get a sense of the very, very fine craftsmanship that they use. You can see all the individual hoofs um, on the reverse, of course, is this very practical, pragmatic handle that would have been used to make the imprint of the ceiling, um, to mark a commodity that would have been traded and so competently manufactured at such an early date that it has survived 5,000 years for us to find today and for me to hold in this moment. So why did this remarkable civilization disappear without trace for thousands of years? It's hard to believe in the heat and dust of the excavated city that a great tributary of the Indus once flowed here, which supplied the city with a wealth of water. There was in fact an indoor bathroom for almost every home and a sophisticated drainage system. But over the millennia, the river changed course leaving the city and its farmlands without water. It's no wonder, then, that this civilization eventually collapsed. The great river Indus dominates the history of civilization here. And as the river shifted course, whole cities came and went. It was here that the next great empire emerged in the Indus Valley, with consequences which would last for a thousand years. So this is the place in 326 BC where that Macedonian megalomaniac Alexander the Great crossed the river as he attempted to conquer India. He didn't actually know where he was going. He arrived with no language, no maps, and in fact, Alexander was so lost that he thought that he had arrived at a distant source of the Nile after having seen crocodiles in the Indus. He was simply driven by a testosterone fueled obsession to outdo the legendary Darius of Persia and find this fabled land to the east, which was known only by rumour. Alexander was a master of self pathologizing. I mean, you have to hand it to him. A bit like Winston Churchill, he made absolutely sure that history would be kind to him by writing the history himself, or at least ensuring that his own biographers came along on his journey with him. One of his historians, Arian, wrote, when Alexander arrived at the river Indus, he found gifts of silver, gold and elephants from Taxilus the Indian. And that prince sent word he would surrender to him Taxila, the largest city near the river Indus. city of Taxila, a thriving cosmopolitan centre, which was just like the Paris and Mumbai of its time. There was a complete cacophony of different languages, customs and influences. Trusting no one, Alexander marched into Taxila, ready for battle. But the governor welcomed him with a tribute of silver. Bribery will get you everywhere and Alexander had made his first ally near the Indus. So I'm being made into a Pakistani lady. Never a bad thing. 
Okay. Everything the Greeks encountered was new, fresh and exotic. The markets would have held spices and foodstuffs unrecognizable to them. Tamarind. It was journalistic gold dust. Alexander's historians were able to give a vivid and sensational account of an ancient society that had previously been unreported and obscure. In the dusty and crowded marketplace in the summer heat of Taxila, Alexander and his men encountered strange customs, languages and influences. It was here that they came across the naked holy men, the Buddhist monks, and where they first encountered the doctrine of the Buddha. The Greeks and their new allies rebuilt the ancient city of Taxila nearby. But this was to be like no other city that India had ever seen before. Today, the city is known as Sirkap. It's actually vast, spread over a really big area. And very quickly, it appears, there is a main boulevard, the high street, and that the city was actually planned uh, very much like a Hellenistic city would have been. So the stamp is clearly here. It's quite amazing actually how many walls are still standing, how neatly ordered they are. And I suspect there would have been a subterranean level, uh, much like you would have found in ancient Athens. It's a quiet, peaceful, very overgrown place now. But it appears here, there were shops, there residences. There was a great sense of order to it, clearly, which is unusual in a typical city of the subcontinent, uh, which has a completely different way of organizing space. And that's the thing I find really striking here. The thing to remember, I think, is that Alexander's arrival was really a moment and just the start of this long relationship between India and Greek culture and Hellenistic culture, which went on for several hundred years. And one result of that Greek invasion was the effect it had on the local religion of Buddhism, which now changed dramatically in its art and architecture. So in amongst these low-lying stone walls is a really complete example of an early Buddhist temple which has all the hallmarks of Greek influence. You've got the stupa in the middle, the steps leading up to it. This motif here actually shows a double-headed eagle. And you can see these beautifully carved acanthus leaves at the top of each of these columns. So all around in the detail you can see the fusion the Hellenistic influence with the traditional local religion of Buddhism. It's beautiful, actually. This, of course, is the path the devotee would have taken in a clockwise motion around the stupa in the hope of accruing good karma, which is, of course, good for all of us. When the Greeks arrived, Buddhism had already been established for some centuries since the death of the Buddha himself in around 480 BC. But their arrival had a fundamental impact on the way the Buddha was now portrayed. Although we're used to seeing the Buddha represented in human form, in the very earliest manifestations, he was actually represented by his absence. He was represented in symbolic form, like this magnificent footprint decorated with symbols of Buddhism, which celebrated aspects of the Buddha's life rather than showing him in human form. And then something really interesting and dramatic starts to happen in this region after the invasion of Alexander the Great. And that is the representation of the Buddha as a real living person in human form. 
It's hard to exaggerate how important a moment this was in the history of Buddhism. For the first time, the Buddha was given features. He had died too long before for anyone to remember what he really looked like. So the features he was given were idealized ones. And the new ideal came from this innovative Indo-Greek culture that took Buddhism from its home on the North Indian plain and embedded it onto a completely new form, one that we might find more recognizable today. Here are youthful Buddhas with hair arranged in wavy curls that resemble Greek sculptures of Apollo. The monastic robe covering both shoulders is arranged in heavy naturalistic folds, reminiscent of a classical toga. And compared to other more rotund Buddhas, he has the toned body of a Greek athlete. To see more examples of this rare and early Buddhist art, I've been invited to a private museum with a fabulous collection that the same family has safeguarded for over seven generations. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. You're welcome to Fukihana Museum. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> this is a very beautiful room. Do you want to have a look to my Absolutely. collection? Absolutely, that would be great. Wow. It's a treasure trove of rare and wonderful objects gathered from all the great civilizations that have arisen along the Indus including the Indo-Greek culture inspired by Alexander's arrival that became known as Gandhara. What's in here? It's... Goodness me. Gandhara. This Gandhara is in limestone. It has a Greek influence. Yeah. Like this one. Mm. Why these Buddhas are so special, you know? Why mm. these Gandharas are so spe special? Because their skills are so high. Mm. They've made beautiful faces. And look at this piece. It's a broken piece, but look at the beautiful smile of Buddha in it. Mm. His lips and Serene. his smile and his, you know. Okay, I'm going to show you something very special of my collection. It is a hidden collection, you know. I've never opened it for anybody else, especially today I'm going to do it for you. special thing I'm going to show you, no other museum will possess, have this kind of thing. This is a original ring of Raja Porus. Porus? Yeah. As in the man who fought against Alexander the, Alexander Great, the Great in 326? Yeah. Gosh. This is done in pure silver. This is incredibly exciting. I'm actually holding the ring yes. worn by Porus. Yes. That's magnificent. Can I put it on? Yeah. You may. You can see that the physiognomy is actually very different. Yeah, definitely. It's a... Uh, Indic. <coughs> Indic. Yeah. And he has the turban yeah. on his head. Big earrings. Big earrings and wearing sunflower. And wearing the sunflower, yes. So how did you come across the ring of porous? Don't ask me all the questions. Family secrets. Family secrets are there. This was not a one-way exchange in Gandhara. The Greeks themselves took gold, silver and sinned cotton back to Europe along what started to become a thriving trade route. But more importantly, they also took with them a myth and a name. The river Indus was the whole subcontinent for the European imagination as India. And the stories that went back with Alexander and his men of a wild, fabulous place filled with mystics, seers and gold were to influence the European view of India for thousands of years. In some ways, you could say we are still unpicking the reality from that myth. For it was after the arrival of Alexander and the long Indo-Greek culture that followed that the idea of India was born. Alexander began his chaotic trek back to Europe in 325 BC. 
leaving behind him an Indo-Greek culture which took on a life of its own. It was a golden age for the growth of Buddhism. A great Buddhist monastery was built here in Taxila, at the crossroads of Asia. So this would have been the original living quarters of the monks, and you can see the cells all around the central courtyard, which would have been filled with water and overlain with lotuses. It would have been a very peaceful sight. But I suppose the thing to remember is that this wasn't a closed monastic life in the way that we think of it today. But actually, this was a, a centre of learning which was very open, very much like the great universities of the modern world. Students at the university came from Persia in the west, India to the south, and from the north along the Silk Route, perhaps most important of all, came acquisitive Chinese pilgrims, many of whom took Buddhist scriptures back with them to China. These were the monks' domestic quarters. Quite intimate little cells, actually very cool in the heat of the day, overshadowed by trees, surrounding trees, and two tiny little niches, one of which perhaps would have been for a candle and some prayer beads, and another one perhaps for Willie Dalrymple's latest novel. Having worked in centers of learning for most of my life, I actually find it really moving to think of the monks living and working here, transcribing Buddhist scriptures into manuscripts and preserving them over hundreds and hundreds of years. They've opened up this cell for me so that I can see a replica of one of the finest of the Buddha statues, which survived intact for centuries because it was protected from the elements. Inside this quiet side chapel, tucked away in this corner. There's this really beautiful, calm image of the Buddha seated in prayer. Now, the original has actually been removed to the museum at Taxila, but this was one of the Buddha images that Sir John Marshall was really moved by when he came upon it back in the 1930s. So you can see here how art began to be used to spread the message of Buddhism through the creation of sensuous form. I find it tragic that so many of the Buddhist sculptures here have been vandalized and now need to be protected from Islamic extremists, while some heads have had to be removed to museums for their own safety. of the Buddha shows him during the six years he undertook fasting as part of his journey to reach Nirvana. And you can see it's actually a complete masterpiece of Buddha sculpture. It's made out of a single piece of schist. And you can see how the full-bodied form has completely withered away and is shown with his ribs protruding, his arteries, his veins. Um, the robes are slipping off him, and in particular, if you look at his face, the eyes are completely sunken, the cheeks are sallow, but there is a certain serenity to his expression. You know, this is not the expression of a dying man, this is the expression of a man who's on a path, looking for something. And if you look very carefully into his eyes, they're actually open. They're actually looking at you as you stand before him. And beneath, you can see the narrative sequence, the story that tells that actually he realised this wasn't the way to enlightenment and that he ended up begging for food to feed himself and continued on his journey to Nirvana. In other regions of South Asia, Buddhism ultimately survived only in small pockets, whereas this area surrounding the High Indus 
had a different kind of sacred landscape altogether. Here, more than 3,000 Buddhist institutions flourished across Kantara. It's a very calm place to be here early in the morning in northern Pakistan. And there's a sense of sadness at how remote these sites are today, uh, given how important they were in transmitting this incredible world religion right across Asia. And the world has not only forgotten, but I suspect it doesn't really know that Buddhism as we know it today actually emanated from this part of the world right here in Pakistan. And Pakistan gets a hard rap for exporting Islamic fundamentalism, which I think is really quite unfair and a very limited view of this rich country. So why was it that Buddhism spread from here to the four corners of Asia? Because this area of Pakistan was at the heart of one of the busiest trade routes in Asia, market towns like these exchanged art, ideas and cultural influence just as easily as they did textiles, ivory and spices. And as the merchant class grew more prosperous, they could afford to turn their attention to manufacturing. These images of the Buddha were being mass-produced to cater for expanding markets in the Far East. The irony is, of course, that a religion based on principles of austerity and rejection of the self, its ego, and material wealth now found itself enveloped in decidedly commercial concerns. The Taxila have always known what sells. It may not be serene statues of the Buddha anymore, but instead we've got shiny, glittering disco leopards, which would not look out of place in a Duran Duran video. So one of the things you see when you're traveling around Pakistan are these incredible bursts of color, uh, which are these painted trucks. And I'm here at the moment in a yard where they not only make the trucks and repair them, but also take great care to decorate them. It's slightly intimidating. It's a very male environment. There aren't any uh, page three pinups, uh, but what there are are these magnificently worked trucks. This is one of my absolute favorites. It's got all the scale of an American juggernaut, but look at the difference. Every inch of this vehicle has been decorated, painted, made colorful. It's glittering in the sunlight. Here in the center, you've got father of the nation, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, flanked by the Pakistani flag. And everywhere there's color, um, symbols of fish which they particularly like here because it gives them lots of opportunity to provide texture and color and pattern. You don't see a lot of color in the, what people wear. Uh, the men are dressed in quite earthy colors and the women may be brightly dressed but many of them are covered uh, in the veil and then you see this incredible burst of color um, along the road for everyone to enjoy. There's a lot of detail on the outside. There's these wonderful tassels. And then when you look on the inside, an absolute driver's boudoir. I wanted to have a look in one of the actual workshops where a lot of the crafting of these designs actually takes place. I like to think that these skills are an echo of the Taxila craftsmen of old. Their fine work with gold, silver and precious stones helped build ancient trade routes here and thus the spread of Buddhism. Yet however successful abroad, by the 8th century Buddhism had all but disappeared in Pakistan itself. So why is there virtually no trace of it in the country that was for so long its home. It's not in Pakistan, but in China and the Far East that Gandharan civilization made its greatest impact.
and its influence can still be felt today. Through the early Chinese pilgrims that came here, Buddhism established a firm foothold in imperial China. So it was natural that in later centuries, Chinese monks would want to return to see the source of their Buddhism. What they found, however, left them saddened. By the time this monastery and stupa at Bambala were built, more than 500 years after Alexander, Buddhism in northwest India was being eclipsed by more intruders from Central Asia. For the stories of grandeur also brought a series of invaders, like the White Huns, upon the region and eventually the grand city of Taxila was brought to its knees. In the seventh century, when the Chinese pilgrim Xuan Sung came to Taxila to find the source of the Buddhism that had transformed China, it lay desolate and in a state of half ruin, a mere shadow of its former glory. He described the monasteries as filled with shrubs and solitary to the last degree, wasted and desolate, and the monks as indolent and given to indulgence and debauchery. And in some ways one could say that the old tolerance of Taxila, the cosmopolitan university open to all faiths, also now lies in ruins. There's a lovely echo around the valley here and you can just imagine how it would have sounded when all the Buddhist monks here would have been chanting. It does feel desolate. It feels like you've happened upon something that's hidden away that was once a great civilization. Um, much of it is still to be excavated and there's a sense of desertion here, which is really quite poignant. There are real contemporary echoes today in terms of the desecration of Buddhist monuments in Bamiyan and also in this region by the Pakistani and Afghan Taliban. Greater Pakistan is probably confused by its Buddhist history only because there's been a state-sponsored Islamic agenda here, which really denies the texture and longevity of this land, which was always a frontier province. It was always many different groups of people. And you can't really undo and unpick that complexity without leaving a vacuum. Invaders who destroyed the old Buddhist cultures were followed out of the Afghan mountains centuries later by more horsemen from the north who brought with them a new religion, Islam. And to explore the Muslim legacy they left behind, I've come back to the city they founded, the cultural center of modern Pakistan, Lahore. In Lahore. It's the middle of Eid, the greatest celebration. It's sort of Christmas, Easter, and everything rolled into one. There's great excitement on the streets, children out playing, big national holiday, and it's just wonderful to be here. It's the best time of year in the Muslim calendar. Although perhaps not if you're a goat or a cow that's been fattened up for the occasion. I love being in this city. The sights, the smells, the sounds, it's like an assault on the senses, but it really, really brings you alive. A 
Around 1000 AD, the Muslim Sultan, Mahmud of Ghazni, gained control of the Indus Valley, and Lahore rose up as a great city under his rule. Scholars and poets gathered from as far away as Iraq and Samarkand, and made Lahore a city of music and the arts. Today, Ali Seti typifies a younger group of Pakistani artists who are rediscovering how much their country's past still has to say to them. Is there something about the fact that it's a song of suffering that draws people to it? Um, yeah, absolutely. Every person that I've ever heard singing it, like sublimates or channels, whatever it is they're feeling, mm. whatever pain or angst or like, you know, achy emotion they're feeling into this song. Mm. And I've heard, I've heard, you know, traditional musicians, people you would call minstrels, singing it um, with tattered clothes at, at shrines, you know, in deserts. And I've heard kids in jeans and t-shirts um, with joints in their hands um, singing this, you know, yeah. um, with great, with great feeling and fervor and taking great ownership of it, you know. And that seems to me to be a, a great miracle of life here, is that despite so much um, truncation and so much revisionism, you know, and so much um, loss of, of what ought to have been memorialized, there is still this persistence, persistence this really amazing persistence mm. of things that are ancient um, and that are very strong and that, that continue to live in us. And that we continue to sort of, sort of pour into newer forms, ever newer forms and styles and, and situations. Mm. And yet we're not conscious of those things. Politically, we are, we're very young, um, and culturally, we're very old. So what does that make us? Um, interesting. That, it interesting. makes Pakistan very interesting. I agree. I agree. To see how Islam has lasted for a thousand years in Lahore, I've come to this ancient shrine. Even though Taliban suicide bombers killed 42 worshippers here in 2010, the congregation still comes to praise Islam in verse, song and dance. You know, uh, spiritual music is very powerful and uh, 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 I think all the people who go to shrines, they lose. Uh, they, they lose themselves. It's like going into another space and it's like a trance. It's, it's a trance. It's the trance music. Uh, I've seen five, five hundred people going into trance for hours. You get uh, caught up in the energy of it as well. You get caught, so caught up in the energy and yeah. uh, the best thing is uh, that they do it not alone. Uh, yeah. They're doing it in uh, yeah. friends and yeah. hundreds of them yeah. doing it. Yeah. And uh, it's like head banging or something that you do it on a rock concert yeah, also. Yeah, yeah. By the 10th century, Lahore was being described as a place with impressive palaces, large markets and huge orchards. 500 years later, this thriving cultural hub of a city became a natural choice for a capital for the greatest of Muslim connoisseurs, the Mughals. For this is where Islam from Persia met the land beyond the Indus to recreate a paradise on earth. Lahore is often described as the city of gardens, of gardens watered by the Indus. The city reached the peak of its glory during the Mughal rule. Not only did they build lavish monuments and splendid gardens, they bestowed upon Lahore customs and traditions that have echoed down the ages. And it's Islam which is often credited with introducing a new concept to Pakistan, the concept of Purda. Purda or Purda was originally a Persian word that 
that came to India with the Mughals and means veil or curtain and was a way for a wife to show complete loyalty to her husband. Eventually it was also taken up by high-class Hindu women as a form of protection. Previously in the subcontinent all women were uncovered from the waist up as we've seen previously in the dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro. And here we have these wonderful architectural metaphors for the veil in these jali screens, uh, which would have been a way to separate the women from the world outside, but also for them to create their own world within. So what lay behind these walls was often very intriguing to the commoner. The politics of the harem was much more complex than we might imagine. Nowhere can this be seen better than in the relationship between the Mughal Emperor Jahangir and his charismatic wife, Nur Jahan. Today's gonna be the day that they're gonna give it back to you. Born on a caravan traveling from Tehran to India, she became the last but most beloved wife of the emperor. Jahangir's two brothers had died of alcoholism, and as crown prince, he was not much better himself, being heavily addicted to opium. So when he came to the throne, he depended completely on his favorite wife to run the kingdom, while he built rock star extravaganzas like this, a minaret in which to keep one of his favorite pet deer. It's perhaps a little unfair to think of Jahangir as the Noel Gallagher of the Mughal Empire, um, because despite being a playboy, he had many other qualities. This was, of course, the long summer of the Mughal Empire, and in that time, he patronized the arts, he built beautiful buildings, and he was a very just emperor. And he had Nur Jahan by his side, with whom he had this complex, romantic, intimate relationship, which involved obviously love, but also political power. And in a sense, they ruled the empire together. behind the magnificent public balcony where the emperor sat to give audience is this darker chamber which was actually the nerve center of power. And who was here? It was Nur Jahan, his beloved wife, the empress, the Mughal empress. And she actually held a lot of power in the Mughal court and made many of the decisions. So she was effectively standing just over his shoulder whispering in his ear, directing him while he was holding court to his public just beyond. So this series of chambers, private chambers, was actually built for Nur Jahan by Jahangir. And she traversed these spaces in privacy, but completely connected to the public government imperial decisions that he was making just a few feet away. So despite the dust and graffiti of centuries, including King Jahangir's phone number, um, you can really get a sense of how magnificent these private quarters would have been. I mean, there's still a lot of intricate paintwork to be seen down here. And there's an image of the sun god right in the center up there. So you have to imagine that these internal chambers would have been really sumptuous. The floors were laid with marble, they would have been covered with Persian and Mughal carpets, and the, the walls would have been very, very colorful, rich palette of colors, to, which would have painted the stucco work. And here in particular, you see a very Persian motif of the vase of flowers, which of course the uh, moguls brought with them to India. I particularly love this space because if you look up, the ceiling is covered with mirrors. And this also, there's a little bit of restoration work that's taken place which shows you um, the depth of color that actually there would have been during the time that Nur Jahan would have been walking through these rooms. And there are remnants still of gold paint 
and blue to be seen on the stucco work above the doorway here. And if you imagine that all of this technicolor would have been with the lighting, would have shone off and reflected from the mirrors that are overhead. So this really would have been a sumptuous interior chamber for the Empress Nur Jahan. Her grip on the reins of imperial power was absolute. But such were the rules of Purda that no other men ever got to see her face, not even bizarrely, the artist who painted her portrait. So Salima, this is a very intimate image hmm. of the private quarters yes. of With, a high-class uh, lady. Yes, and preparing herself for uh, you know, her toilette and mm. obviously preparing herself for something important. And when you consider that it is invariably a male artist uh, who's doing this, and uh, with no access. So there would have been no access. Certainly absolutely. Not this kind. No, no, no access at all. So this is kind of second-hand information which was fed to uh, the artist. And presumably through, through the presumably through the informants. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but so that you know, there's a lot of imagination, a little bit of fantasy, mm. uh, which is involved in this. So, but then there are other ways, you know, in which presumably they got to know what women did, what they got up to. So you find you do have works. I mean, for example, that one, mm -hmm. in which um, there, there's a there's a rival life going on in the women's quarters, in which the women Amongst are... Amongst the in, women themselves. Yeah, yeah, and then they're enjoying themselves. They have some of the same pastimes as men, actually. Mm. They're smoking, they're, you know... Drinking. Uh, I don't know whether that they were drinking the same things, but right. presumably they were having a jolly good time. Jahangir's reign was a golden age that only came to an end with his death in 1627. The tomb that was built for him was magnificent in its ostentation. The building was clad in zigzags of white and yellow marble, and there was once an ornate pavilion built here on the roof. But not far away is the much smaller mausoleum of Nur Jahan. She had tried to intervene with Jahangir's succession and as a consequence was confined to Lahore for the rest of her days. She lies not alongside the love of her life, but beside her daughter in an unassuming tomb she had to build for herself. She left a message that expresses her sorrow. Nobody would come to light a lamp. No moths would come to burn their wings on such lamps. And no cuckoos would even sing within the tombs of Nur Jahan and her daughter. But to remember Nur Jahan best, I've been allowed to return to the beautiful Palace of Mirrors in the women's quarters of the Lahore Fort, at night when it's empty and deserted. This surely is her true spiritual resting place, as a woman who patronized the arts and help make Lahore a glittering center for artists and writers, as it still is. <laughs> Lahore is a very special city because here you find all the arts. It is also a city of music and of politics. If this wasn't a dry country, I could have sworn there was something in this orange juice, but it's at parties like this that you can really sense that visual artists, writers, poets in Pakistan today are really engaging with the rich cultural past and unpicking it 
and exposing it and exploring it um, to reveal that this isn't just a country with a 50-year Islamic history, but something much, much deeper. So what I've done is I've... Uh, she has raised all the funding. One of the artists at the party has produced a work that has become famous and which explores the tensions between old and new Pakistan and its relationship with the West. I've been particularly drawn to this remarkable series that you did called The Veil. Can you tell me, firstly, what inspired you? What was the moment that made you choose this subject? Uh, I was just intrigued to see in, the, uh, in the, this post 9-11 period mm. to see Western media um, in particular, whenever there was a mention of uh, a Muslim country, it will be referenced with image of a veiled woman. Mm. And uh, uh, so, uh, so in a way, I think it kind of reduces uh, the representation of uh, women from a certain part of the world, mm. um, which made me think of another simplification of the women in the minds of the uh, uh, men, especially from the non-Western world because of their exposure to pornography. So in this work, Rashid has used this um, process of photo montage where when you enter the room, you encounter one particular image, which on this occasion is a series of burqa clad women completely veiled, including the face. And then when you come in closer, you're, you're you're opened up to a whole other landscape. The pixelations are tiny images of pornography, uh, which are captured from the internet and widely disseminated all over the world. So he's playing on that idea of the contradictions of the perceptions that we have in this apparent distinctions between what goes on in the East and the West. Pakistan has a population of over 200 million people, greater than Russia. Its position at the crossroads of Asia makes it crucial to world politics. And yet my journey through the country has been a reminder of how little outsiders know about its complicated past and equally complicated present. Today, Pakistan is searching for its identity, not because it doesn't have one, but because this civilization, this 5,000-year-old civilization, is so textured and multi-layered. And some of that history is shared and contested with its neighbor, India, but a lot of it isn't, because this was always a frontier land between India to the south and China to the north, Afghanistan, Iran, and ancient Babylon and Greece. And running through this, like an artery nourishing the civilizations that have lived here, has been the River Indus. In the next episode of Treasures of the Indus, I'll explore what happened when the Islamic conquerors who swept into Lahore in the 16th century traveled even further down into India. When the Islam of the Mughals collided with the kingdoms of Hindustan and created some of the finest architecture the world has ever seen. And the BBC's India season continues here on BBC4 tomorrow as William Dalrymple unearths the story of the white Mughals. Love and betrayal in India is here at nine. Bye.